as editor of Krasnoyanov mm -hmm. in 19 uh, around 1920, and he was he was a, of course he was a Bolshevik and so on, but he was he was a, an, an intelligent man and he tried to fight against the uh, the propaganda yeah. and so on, and he introduced some interesting writers to Russian authors. Mm -hmm. Among them, um, the Norwegian Nobel Prize uh, winner Knut Hamsun. Knut Hamsun, yeah. He wrote literary portraits yeah. of uh, Sigmund Freud, of, uh, yeah. of uh, Alexei Tolstoy, yeah. of many of these uh, um, writers who, you know, had other views. Yeah. So he tried to kind of humanize and... Uh, the propaganda, the, yeah. the official yeah. ideology. ideology. Yeah. Yeah. But it became increasingly difficult for him, and he was marginalized, and he was pushed out, and then he was excluded twice from the party and mm -hmm. taken in again. <coughs> And then he was arrested, and he ended his life in the gulags of Stalin. Yeah. And when I did my doctor degree, I was in St. Petersburg and Moscow, mm -hmm. and I interviewed his uh, his family. Yeah. And they gave me access to the family archives and so on. It's a terrible, tragic history of yeah. Stalinism. Yeah. So this is my these tragic figures, uh, these tra tragic characters. Yeah, the really, yeah, the repression in, in this uh, yeah. Bolshevik yeah. idea and uh, yeah. became victims of the yeah. uh, uh, the great repression yeah. and so on. My master dissertation in Russian literature is about Boris Pasternak, mm -hmm. and uh, so uh, so I I'm I'm a specialist in Russian. Literature, culture, language, okay. and also politics. Mm -hmm. I'm trained. I have two master degrees. My first master degree mm -hmm. was in political science, mm -hmm. and then after that, I worked in the in business. I worked in the government and so on. I served in the Middle East as a as a commercial diplomat, and uh, and then later I I did uh, also a master degree in Russian. Mm -hmm. and also a doctor degree. And um, here in this department uh, I work uh, with many things, entrepreneurship and so on, but uh, I'm always consulted about Russia. And uh, I've been to the Ukraine. I, I like the Ukraine. I went to the Crimea and Sudak uh, and I've traveled a, a bit around. I have unfortunately not much experience from the Ukraine, so I'm primarily a specialist on Russian affairs. I'd like to know more about the Ukraine, and when mm -hmm. I comment on the conflict between uh, Russia and the Ukraine, my, my primary perspective is the Russian media and, yeah. and so on. So, so this let is me. just to explain okay. to you my background. Yes. And let me begin. Pronunciation of your name. Robert uh, Wallace. Yes, w Wallace. You Wallace. know, my mother was English or, or Scottish, so uh, uh, so. Robert uh, Wallace. Wallace and Wagan. Wagan. Wagan, yeah. Wallace, Wallace. yeah Wagan. Mm -hmm. The two A's are all really yeah. in Norwegian, mm -hmm. so it's Vogan, but uh, Vogan. I can understand a lot uh, through German and English. Oh, yeah, yeah, by, sure. by, by reading, by reading, I uh, understand almost everything. Mm -hmm. I'm uh, <laughs> hearing not. Uh, yeah, but your your German is really good. I mean, oh, you speak you. excellent, excellent German. And my colleague says hello. By the way, she went back now to uh, Stuttgart, mm -hmm. so uh, she, we enjoyed the meeting at your your embassy. Thanks. Uh, так, сейчас начинаем тогда. Чуденское число? Семнадцатое апреля, город Осло, профессор Роберт Волос Воган. Сегодня программа «Русская идея и украинская мечта» находится в гостях в городе Осло. Мы в университете Осло и Акерхус в гостях у профессора Роберт Волос Воган. Добрый день. Добрый день. 
uh, we shall speak about uh, the uh, contemporary attitude of the uh, Norwegian media to the uh, war in the eastern Ukraine. What uh, is the uh, typical or official position of uh, Nor uh, Norwegian media uh, to these events? Well, I think first we can begin by saying that the official Norwegian policy towards the Ukraine is, is quite positive and supportive. This is official Norwegian policy. Uh, we are quite critical of what Russia has done in uh, the Crimea and the annexation of the Crimea. Uh, you know that the present Secretary General of yeah. NATO was, a, was our former Prime Minister. And we have a very clear and critical uh, position uh, on what Russia has done. Uh, annexation of the Crimea, supporting the separatists in Luhansk, Donetsk and so on, supplying them with arms. Uh, and uh, that is why Norway has also followed the European Union in the sanctions against Russia. So uh, we are very critical of what Russia has done uh, and is doing in eastern Ukraine. We are in support of uh, President Poroshenko and uh, the Ukrainian government. And we uh, hope, of course, that uh, the Minsk II agreement is respected by both sides. So this, in brief, is the general feeling in Norway, and it's also the general feeling and sentiment of Norwegian media. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, one thing uh, is the official position of the government and uh, of some press agencies and things like that. Another thing is the public opinion. What do people say about this conflict? I have an experience uh, from the United States and from Germany uh, from l l last months and uh, um, the opinions of people in Germany is uh, very contradictive mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes are absolutely polar. Uh, what, uh, do, what can you say about uh, the public opinion in Norway? Mm -hmm. Well, again, Norway has a common border with Russia. And uh, I think Norwegian attitudes and public opinion to the Ukraine is very much influenced by how we feel about Russia, because we have a common border with we Russia. We have a neighbor. We are neighbors. Yeah. Uh, we have a border of about 190 kilometers in the high north with Russia. And we have had these negotiations going on for many, many years about the, uh, the maritime border in the Barents Sea. And Spitsbergen as well. And, yeah, and, uh, well, Spitsbergen or Svalbard, as we call it, is, is a bit different because uh, it is under Nor Norwegian sovereignty. Yeah. But there is a treaty governing, you know, the exploitation of resources in, in Svalbard. And uh, Russia has a presence there. They are extracting mine and, uh, mine and uh, coal and so yeah. on. And uh, we d disagree with Russia on uh, fishing rights and the uh, continental shelf uh, and, and oil and energy resources and so on. But the, uh, the government reached an agreement with Russia in 2010 and we were able successfully to draw a, a maritime border yeah. between uh, the Norwegian and the Russian sphere. So, this problem had been going on for 40 years, so we are very happy that the Red-Green uh, government of Prime Minister, or the previous Prime Minister Stoltenberg reached this agreement with Russia when uh, President Medvedev was, uh, was um, president in, in Russia in 2010. So, uh, so we, we of course are dictated in our feelings to the Ukraine, we are dictated by this big, big neighbor uh, called uh, Russia. Um, I, th I think most Norwegians, you will ask, are supportive of uh, the Ukrainian government and the Ukrainian people and their struggle and what they are facing now in eastern Ukraine. Of course, some Norwegians will say that things could have been done a bit differently by the, the government in Kiev. Uh, they c could have maybe, you know, done a bit more towards uh, the Russian-speaking uh, minorities in eastern Ukraine and so on. But, uh, you know, I, th I think most Norwegians, you will ask, uh, find that what Russia has done 
is totally out of proportion. It is not justified. It's, it's a violation of international law. And also the downing of this uh, airplane where, when uh, several hundred people were killed, you know. It was a decisive point, I think. Uh, yes, it, it has created a, a big, uh, and it was most probably done by separatists under with Russian arms and instructed and so on by, by the Russian, Russian officer, yeah. officers. Yeah. And although there are mutual recriminations and that there's a, pro a war for, of information from both sides, I, I, I actually I actually think that uh, most Norwegians are quite supportive of the Ukrainian people. Uh, you are uh, an author of the thesis Media Driven Society. Yeah. Media Driven Society. And uh, now what we have uh, in Russia and Ukraine uh, it's a real war, a real media war uh, between uh, Russia and the whole world. Uh, I think you uh, lived and you worked in St. Petersburg and you have experience with uh, Russians and with, with Russian media. How can you comment the p p position uh, of uh, Russian media, especially on, of uh, Russia today and uh, Yeah, well, let, let's take the long perspective. The, the chaos of the Yeltsin era, the 1990s, you know, when there was uh, media plurality and so on, has been now uh, replaced by increasing state control and there are very hardly any free independent critical media in Russia today as, as most of us know. Uh, also Russia for some years ago they changed their military doctrine. They are now fighting what they call a hybrid war and they use all kinds of means, not just propaganda but they use cyber warfare, they have troll factories etc. So they are using the social media. So it's it's a new kind of, of warfare where they are fighting with information, military arms, cyber cyber attacks, and so on, and disinformation. So it, it's, it's a totally new type of situation, and um, and we we are quite quite worried about developments. The head of the Norwegian uh, military has identified Russia as a, a long-term, not an immediate, but a long-term political uh, and military threat to Norway. Yeah. Because... It's the official, official position. It's the official position of Norway. We, we don't see Russia as an immediate military threat here and now because we don't have a big uh, Russian population in Norway. But uh, we, we, we have a common border with Russia and we have a long history of negotiation with Russia. Uh, we, uh, we think that uh, several factors now uh, are combining to make the situation a bit more unclear. Uh, there is a politically volatile situation in Russia, although Putin is uh, claimed to be very popular, he gets 85% in polls and so on. Um, it's very unclear what can happen. So the, the Norwegian military is uh, worried that if he disappears, uh, somebody who is even worse can, can replace him. And it's very unpredictable what they want to do. They are building up their military power. They're going to spend more money on the military than on social welfare. And uh, they have renewed their their air forces, their tanks and ships and so on. So it seems that Russia is building up an enormous military power and they're willing to use it. They're willing to use it to annex the Crimea. Uh, we saw, for instance, uh, what they did in Georgia. Excuse me, I've also written an article in the same journal about the, uh, the war in, uh, in between Georgia and Russia in two, December 2008. So, uh, Moldova, the Baltic states, East U Ukraine, etc. Uh, Russia is, is willing to use military power against its near neighbors, and Norway is a near neighbor. Is, but it, not, is it not a new challenge for uh, Norwegia and for uh, NATO? Well, Norway is a member of NATO, yeah. and uh, and we we uh, you know rely on NATO. We're a small country; we're just five million people. And the old uh, prime minister in Norway, Knut Fridlund, he used a, a very good metaphor to describe uh, Russia and, and Norway. 
Norway is a small country. It's like it's positioned between, beside. This was the Soviet times. This big, big bear is sleeping. Yeah. And the bear could roll over in its sleep and, and crush uh, Norway. And I've said in some interviews that the difference uh, today is that the bear has woken up. And it's investing yeah. in the military and so on. And we saw recently, and the Norwegian military uh, has said that we saw recently a military, a big, big uh, Russian military exercise in the north. So, yes, we, we, we are worried, but I, I have to stress that we don't, uh, we have friendly relations with Russia. We, we, there are many Norwegians living um, in Russia, there are many Russians in Norway. We enjoy good relations, but we are worried about the military build-up and that the regime is willing to use power. That this is uh, unsettling for us, yeah. Most people in Germany, for instance, uh, they consider uh, this war uh, not a war between Russia and Ukraine, but bet a war between uh, Russia and America or Russia and Na NATO. Yeah. And you know, the official um, propaganda, official media in Russia says the reason of this war, the reason for this war uh, was NATO, which tries to come near. Uh, mm -hmm next to uh, Russian borders. How do you think? Is it the uh, reason indeed of this war? Well, uh, Russia... Or, ju or just, a pre just a pretext? Well, uh, you know, intentions are one thing, and uh, what Russia has said is that they, they feel that NATO has broken agreements from the early 1990s. They have expanded eastwards. Uh, and uh, they consider certain territories like their key uh, spheres of influence. They consider uh, the Ukraine, uh, justified or not, as a, a sphere of influence. And, of course, when, uh, when Khrushchev gave away the Crimea uh, to, um, in 1954 to, to the Ukraine, uh, almost without consultation, uh, this was not taken lightly by Russia. So they, as you know, they, they say this is Russian uh, territory, Nova, Russia, all this and so on. Um, and Russia has this idea of the Eurasian Union, you know, that they're trying to build up uh, the opposite of the EU. So Russian rhetoric, Russian uh, political propaganda says that yes, NATO is, is expanding, they're surrounding us and so on, and they are moving into countries that used to be part of the Soviet Union. So Russia, and, and this is what Putin, as you know, he says to the Russian audience in this interview he gave now, yeah. you know, they are surrounding us and it's not we who are making the problems, it's NATO, and so it's America and so on. What do you think about it? Well, you know, it's... Uh, it's uh, As an analyst and a special, an expert for media. Well, you know, my job is to provide a, pro a professional, neutral, objective okay. analysis. That, as mm -hmm. a free academic, that's my, my yeah. position. Mm -hmm. So I have to look at the old perspectives. And um, since I'm a, a specialist in Russian affairs, then I, I'm often asked what what's going on in, inside Putin's head and so on, what do the Russians think. So what I can say is that they changed the military doctrine, as, as I said. They have invested in their military, they are showing muscle, and they used to be a superpower, and then they became, uh, became something much less than a superpower. Now they yeah. are building themselves up. Uh, they have resources, they have all this oil and energy, but the ruble has fallen, the price of all the oil has fallen, there are the sanctions, etc. So, uh, you know, uh, I, d I don't think there are any simple, clear answers to what uh, Russia is, uh, is, uh, is thinking. They are definitely, they want, again, a, a bipolar system with two superpowers. Yeah. I mean, they, they don't like America as the one dominating yeah. power. Yeah. So they're trying to become... One polar world, yeah. 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 They, they, in many ways, they're trying to restore the, the old bipolar system of Soviet times. And, yeah. and this is... Uh, the results uh, of influence. Yeah. Yeah. 
uh, we know that uh, Russian propaganda and Russian, uh, Russian official media influenced a lot of people in Russia and in Eastern Ukraine. Yes. Uh, there is a kind of um, opposition to America. Yes, well, uh, what, what can I say? Uh, if, uh, it's interesting to see that uh, those circles, and you say Germany, certain segments and so on, it's interesting to see that the political forces in Europe that seem to uh, understand or, you know, Putin are the extreme right in, in Hungary, in France, yeah. Italy, and so on, and that uh, Putin, you know, his tough his tough attitude strikes a chord with yeah. the extreme right in some European countries. So extreme right and extreme left. Yeah, <laughs> supporting Greece, Putin. Greece, Greece. It's interesting. <laughs> it's uh, yeah. I mean, uh, America. Of course, uh, you know there are many people who are critical of America. Uh, they dominate, uh, you know, culture and so on. And uh, in in media studies, uh, look at look at France, for instance. Yeah. Mondialisation is a negative word. I mean, globalization in French is a negative word. It means Americanization. So, uh, yeah, there are many who are critical of America, and that's true, but um, uh, I, th I think the people who understand, uh, who understand Russia, there, there has been a debate in, uh, in Norway, um, some Norwegians who, uh, who have expressed opinions in, in the media, say that we have to try and understand Russian history and so on, they have been offended and uh, they need to restore their self-image and so on, and uh, some even, uh, yeah, so, so some would try and understand more, but again, uh, they have uh, used military might to annex an area of a neighboring country, the Ukraine. I mean, the, 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 it's, a, it's, a, it's a violation of international law, and we have to insist on this. So, in the final analysis, I, I, I think uh, what has been given by the Norwegian head of the mil Norwegian military is, is, is what most Norwegians would actually tell you. We can hear a lot of opinions of uh, some politologists and journalists uh, comparing uh, Putin with Adolf Hitler and comparing the situation uh, with uh, Czechoslovakia in 1939 mm -hmm. with the situation with Ukraine. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think about this opinion? Well, uh, historical parallels are always difficult, you know, appeasement, when do you say stop, and uh, if we don't, we're not tough now with Putin, it will be like a uh, reenactment of what happened in uh, Munich and so on. Uh, yeah, I mean, there, uh, I think the Norwegian military is, is quite clear on this when they, when they, in their analysis, when they have pointed to this massive build-up of military power. And uh, as you may know, in, in Norway, the, the, for many, many years, they have build, they've been building down the military. They have been not giving enough resources and so on. So the military in Norway now is, is in a very weak position. And this is a, a political discussion going on in Norway. The present government says this has been a massive mistake. Yeah. The military itself has been very unhappy with the developments over the last 10, 15 years. And now uh, they, they, they are calling for increased uh, spending for, for military, the military in Norway. Um, is, is Putin uh, like Hitler? Well, I think, uh, I, think uh, I, I wouldn't like to draw too many historical parallels, but uh, Putin is uh, certainly a, a powerful figure in uh, heading a very big military power and he's willing to use it against neighboring countries. But uh, I won't, don't want to be quoted uh, saying that Putin is, is Hitler. I think that's... Uh, he's not Hitler, but if we continue uh, this parallel, um, we know the development uh, of the events in the time of Hitler. Um, for, uh, for much people in Eastern Europe, especially in Baltic countries, in uh, Poland, uh, they are afraid of the possibility of the development of the situation like in, uh, during the uh, Second World War. Is it possible? 
Well, uh, I, th I think uh, certainly when the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991 and it was proven that communism didn't work, you know, there were maybe 25 million Russians living in the, in the satellite countries, including the, the Baltic countries. Yeah. And, uh, and, and I mean, if you've been to, let's say, to, to Vilnius, if you have seen the uh, Museum of Genocide that used to be the KGB headquarters, if you have seen the torture chambers, and, uh, you know, you can understand that uh, many people uh, hate, hate the Russians for historical reasons. Um, but, uh, you know... Uh, I think I think the military analysis would be that it's primarily these countries that have uh, Russian minorities uh, that should feel threatened. Yeah. We saw it in South Ossetia and in Abkhazia where they were issuing passports and inflating the number of Russians and then saying the Russian constitution sa says that you have to defend the interests of Russians, etc., and using this as a pretext for intervention. You know, the um, same pretext had uh, Hitler. Mm. So, so that in Deutschland, uh, for instance, uh, he's um, told about uh, German, uh, ethnic Germans who live in this territory. And the same pretext had Putin in, in Crimea and in Donbass, actually. Mm. Yeah, so, um, I mean, I the methods and the way is yeah. very similar. Yeah. I understand your your point. I, I, I hear what you're saying, but uh, you know my my uh, position would be to be a cautious with historical yeah. parallels. Mm -hmm. So um, it's, it's uh, exaggeration. You mean? Uh, yeah, I, I would this, be, attem this, this attempt to consider it like that. Yeah. Yeah, I would be cautious. I can understand that uh, in in the Ukraine you you are you are comparing him him with uh, Hitler. I it's a very it's, yeah. it's a very po popular point of view yeah. for, okay. for, for, okay. for many people. I understand. I read for some, my compatriots. Yeah. yeah, I I can understand that you do that, but. Again, my role as as an yeah. as a, a Norwegian analyst looking at this, I would be careful to compare, you know, uh, historical periods and uh, and uh, events like this. So, uh, Putin is uh, is an enigma. We don't really know what's going on in uh, in his mind. He has a small circle of advisors. It's very unpredictable what's going to happen. But uh, uh, we 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 are worried in Norway, and we, that is why official policy uh, is is that we must insist on the Minsk II agreement. I mean, just now I read the uh, the reports from the uh, G7 meeting in Lübeck and so on, and they say clearly that if uh, and they especially appeal to Russia. Russia has to pull out these separatists, and it's primarily both sides, of course, have to deliver. But it's primarily the Russian side that they have to demilitarize, pull out the separatists, and comply fully with the Minsk II agreement. If they don't do that. There's talk of further sanctions. So I think the way uh, NATO and the European Union and also Norway wants to deal with this is to be predictable, uh, make it clear that actions have consequences, and be very consistent and agree. You know, this is the EU and NATO policy, and Norway fully agrees with this. In a media driven society, um the people is very influenced uh, uh, by um, official uh, uh, opinion, and now we uh, can um, see uh, how during one year uh, public opinion in Russia uh, changed, and uh, it goes uh, not only about uh, political and ideological uh, items; it goes about culture and cultural orientation and things like that. You wrote uh, books about Boris Pasternak and about um, uh, Alexander Vorovsky. Uh, Alexander yes. Vorovsky. Sorry, you are an expert on Russian literature and Russian culture as well. Uh, what do you think uh, about uh, the influence on Russian mentality and Russian culture of uh, this media uh, war which uh, happens now? 
Well, you know, television has long been the favorite, um, the favorite information source for uh, Russians, and today it's dominated yeah. by, by, by the state. The internet is also now facing increasing uh, censorship. We have these troll factories and so on. I have Russian friends and contacts who are very critical, you know, of developments now. We see that some Russians are, you said yesterday, I believe, in your yeah. that Russians are buying uh, apartments in Kiev. We know that some Russians are buying now housing, uh, for instance, in the Baltic countries. So the, some Russians are preparing for the possibility. In America, yeah. I, I met a yeah. lot of Russian dissidents yeah. in, the San, yeah. in San Jose, in yeah. San Francisco. Yeah. And there is a big Russian diaspora, so many Russians are, are concerned about the developments in Russia. Uh, the Levada Institute, you know, they, they give him like 85% uh, favorable opinion, opinion polls, but uh, many analysts, and including myself, would say that we have to be very careful about, I think these popularity ratings are very inflated. There are critical Russians. I think the, the business people in Russia, if the economy in Russia worsens further, and if Putin is not able to deliver, you know, welfare for his, his people, uh, I, I think uh, he's going to be replaced. So uh, it's not that all Russians are bad or uh, completely uncritical towards Putin. No, I, I know many who are critical of him. But unfortunately, they, they have to keep a low profile. What is your prognosis about uh, the development of uh, the situation with the media in Russia? In pro propaganda, ideology and media? Uh, I'm not positive. It has gotten steadily worse from Putin took over. He, he, uh, he did away with the oligarchs. He, then he, he completely monopolized the media. The Russian Journalist Association, as I think I mentioned yesterday, on its website, in, in both in the English and Russian and English version, they have a databases of, as the last time I checked, 315 journalists who have been murdered in Russia. So, you know, being a journalist is a dangerous profession uh, in Russia. And many of these uh, murders have not been investigated. Very few have been brought to trial. Uh, Nemtsov uh, was now assassinated. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, it doesn't look good. We, we are pessimistic about the, the future of media in Russia. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for uh, this interview. Большое спасибо. Большое спасибо. Спасибо всего доброго. Напомню, мы uh, в гостях у доктора Роберт Волос Ваган. Это профессор факультета общественных наук и отдела журналистики и медийных, медийных студий, медийных исследований. Большое вам спасибо. Спасибо вам.